Federica, can we start? Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, good afternoon to all the panelists and, and all the people uh, joining you from different places. Uh, my name is Marco Camilla, Chief of the Division of Digital Transformation and AI at UNIDO, based in uh, Vienna, Austria. Uh, we are organizing this hybrid event uh, linking Vienna and South Africa with Doha. This side event is presented by UNIDO and the UN Technology Bank. Uh, UNIDO works on productive transformation, supporting the industry that comprises manufacturing, services, and digital platforms. We work with private sector and support public sector on policies that help member states to improve productive capacity, growth, and development. And the United Nations Technology Bank for least developed countries is a global organization dedicated to enhance the contribution of science, technology, and innovation for sustainable development in the world's 46 least developed countries. The Doha program of action for LDCs for the decade 2021-2030 strengthened the mandate of the Technology Bank by assigning the bank the role of a focal point for LDCs on science, technology, and innovation related issues. Let me provide a, a quick introduction on LDCs. The LDCs are the least connected to the internet at about 20% of the population. Although some least developed countries are on a positive de developmental path toward meeting the threshold for graduation, many more remain extremely fragile. LDCs are especially vulnerable to being left behind given their dependence on labor intensive manufacturing. So collaborative approaches are a necessity as we seek to make progress in this area. LDCs can speed their transition to industrialized countries by skipping through traditional development phases with the support of digital transformation of their communities and economic sector. Strategically implementing frontier technologies can result in a potent combination of resources and capabilities that can produce growth that is higher quality, more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient. However, the majority of LDCs are still distant from utilizing these cutting edge technologies. So some of the topics that we are uh, going to discuss uh, in this event is that identifying concrete pathways to harness the benefit of frontier technologies, uh, enhance uh, knowledge and awareness, highlight the main challenges in implementing uh, the digital transformation. We will also refer to access to finance and boost opportunities for collaboration and coordination between relevant players in the public and private sector. So we have divided this event in two parts. The, the first part is on the um, uh, bottlenecks uh, or obstacles of LDCs adopting frontier technologies. Uh, outlining the challenges and identifying priority areas on the macro, meso, and micro level. And the part two that, the, that are approaches for LDCs to tackle the challenges raised uh, in part one on the bottlenecks. So for this first part, uh, we have uh, two uh, keynote uh, presentations. So one is a keynote address by Radnakar Adhikari. And the second is a keynote presentation by Tormon uh, Fredrickson uh, from UNTAC. Um, uh, Rana Harat Hikari is the executive director enhanced, uh, of the Enhanced Integrated Framework. Uh, and the Enhanced Integrated Framework, the AIF, is the multilateral partnership of more with more than 50 countries dedicated to assisting least developed countries to leverage trade as an aging and for growth. Uh, sustainable development and poverty reduction. Uh, uh, Radnahar has been the executive director of the EIS since October uh, 2013. And prior to this assignment, uh, he was the chief executive director of South Asia Watch on Trade, Economics and Environment. And previously, he was senior advisor to the National Planning Commission, the government of Nepal, and a trade specialist uh, for the United Nations Development Program. Uh, at the Asia uh, Pacific Regional Center in Colombo, in Sri Lanka. 
so the uh, Radna card, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Julia, who was in the panelists and I also want to thank the even uh, Technology Bank and uh, UNIDO for providing this opportunity. What I would like to do uh, here is to do two things actually. Uh, start with the uh, with some of the opportunities uh, uh, about fourth industrial revolution and how LDCs and the enterprises within the LDCs have been able to harness the potential of fourth industrial revolution. Then on the second part, uh, what I would like to do is, what are the challenges that we still face um, in LDCs? And uh, those challenges, when we talk about challenges, I'll try to offer you know, some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, ideas on how those challenges can be addressed. Uh, so uh, let me start with the um, opportunities and how com companies and enterprises are utilizing the opportunity of uh, the fourth industrial revolution technology. Let me start with blockchain, for example. This is a technology distributed ledger, um, and then this has been utilized particularly for supply chain management and, and traceability, tracking and, uh, and traceability. And, and this technology has been utilized by company um, companies in Ethiopia, for example, to um, enhance traceability of coffee beans as well as to uh, manage the supply chain dimension of coffee beans. And this has helped them to really um, enhance the credibility of the uh, traceability process as a result of which they would be in a position to um, fetch higher prices or premium prices from the coffee bean that are produced by farmers. And then the, 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 the real beneficiary of this would be the farmers who are uh, producing coffee beans. Similarly, EIF, our own organization, working together with UNSCAP, United Nations Economic and Social Commission in, in Asia. Um, we are actually developing a module for paperless trade in, in, in four countries. Uh, these are all four graduating LDCs in, in Asia, uh, including uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Timor Leste where we are piloting the blockchain technology in order to enhance the paperless uh, uh, trade uh, prospects in these countries. Then if you talk about another, um, you know, for industrial revolution technology, which is drone, Rwanda is a classic example where Jeepline um, has been uh, partnering with uh, UPS and Gavi to deliver blood uh, through the drone to, to remote areas and then this Jeep uh, line has now found um, access to Tanzania, Mar Tanzanian market as well in East Africa, where they have mobilized 40 million in venture capital fund to replicate this success that has been achieved so far in Rwanda. Similarly, 3D printing, we have somebody from Bangladesh here, so he would probably be in a position to elaborate this further. Um, Anish, uh, who probably knows that. There is a company called Planeter, which is based in Chitgong in Bangladesh, uh, which, is, which has been manufacturing uh, uh, industrial robots, including uh, 3D printed robots for export uh, to various countries, including South Korea. Then I will um, provide the example of artificial intelligence. Um, in Nepal, which is, happens to be my own country, where there is a company called Cloud Factory, which is uh, you know, based in four different jurisdictions, USA, UK, uh, Nepal, and Kenya. And they are providing data labeling, quality control, uh, and processing support to clients abroad. And they have recently introduced what is known as accelerated annotation that blends the best of AI-powered automation and human expertise to deliver labels for image data sets five times faster. Then we also have a company called, I, um, entity called ICOG uh, Labs in Ethiopia that provides similar backend support to, um, to clients in developing countries. So what, what we gather from the, these examples is that LDCs have been participating in the 4IR 
value chain or as the end user. So, which, which both of which are important. We are talking about the value chain. I just want to emphasize one point. You know, just like the slicing of the value chain that we discuss, you know, in the context of manufacturing, there's a slicing of the value chain, similar kind of, a, you know, a process that takes place in the, uh, in the fourth industrial revolution technology as well, AI being case in point, where bulk of the high-end services are performed in the developed countries and low-end services are performed in a more competitively uh, priced countries, you know, such as these developed countries. So there's a lot of potential, but then there are challenges. What are the challenges? I just want to highlight three major challenges and the, this is a kind of a framework that I have prepared myself. Uh, and, and these I was three A's. One is the accessibility challenge. Second one is the affordability challenge. And the third one is the challenge relating to application. The first, accessibility. Intellectual property rights is a, is a major problem. It may not be a problem to a certain extent, but then it can be a major problem also because 90% of the intellectual property um, or invention of intellectual properties uh, held in five jurisdictions, you know, basically USA, uh, European Union, um, Japan, Korea, and China have more than 90% of the intellectual property rights protection, the companies there. The challenge is that um, you know, some of these um, enterprises in LDCs can make use of open source technology, but after, um, after some time, they have to pay premium prices for which, uh, you know, uh, the IPRs are protected in the, these five jurisdictions. So that could challenge the accessibility <laughs> dimension. But then another accessibility dimension is the lack of infrastructure. When you talk about lack of infrastructure, electricity is the backbone infrastructure that is needed to power the digital revolution or the fourth industrial, um, uh, fourth industrial revolution. And remember the fact that, you know, we discussed yesterday in another panel, the 45%, less than 45% of people in LDCs have access to electricity. How will they power the digital um, the revolution? Then, you know, the second one is the broadband access, which is around 36% of the people uh, in LDCs have broadband access. So that leaves almost 64% of the people without access. So how will they be able to utilize uh, this technology? The second one is affordability. Affordability, two dimensions. One is the high cost of uh, devices, um, and the another is the high cost of uh, internet uh, access. So, uh, for example, um, you know, in the case of high cost of devices, it is, there's a simple solution, which is to um, reduce tariff on these devices if these devices are imported. If you don't have a domestic industry to protect, go ahead and protect by all means. But if you don't have a domestic industry to protect, don't use um, uh, the, the, the tariff on these devices as a mechanism for extracting revenue from consumers. So that is uh, counterproductive. Therefore, it is important uh, to, uh, you know, I, if there's, a, if there's an important role for the trade policy to play there. Then the second aspect is the high cost of internet. And then if there is one or two service providers, um, uh, if there's a monopoly or duopoly uh, among service providers, then the prices tend to be high. But then when there is a competition from the private sector in particular, then, then the prices can come down. So that would resolve the problem of affordability. Then third is the problem of application for which two dimensions are very, very important. One is the dimension of education and skill. And particularly the education and skill on um, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, as well as other basic skills that are required in order to take advantage of the opportunity. So that does not exist in many of these LDCs, but there is a potential to improve that. And then uh, the, the, the other aspect are the, you know, the policies. When you talk about policy, two kinds of policies are very, very important. One is the enabling policies, such as ICT policies, which provides, which requires universal uh, service obligation to the service providers, or a trade policy such as reduction of tariff, uh, fiscal policies such as providing incentive. Is, these are the enabling policies that would help uh, the countries to 
move up to this, uh, you know, digital ladder, move, move up the digital ladder. But then there are um, other mitigating policies also that are required to be put in place in order to help them to um, avoid the challenges or mitigate the challenges, such as privacy uh, related policy or cyber security related policy. So these policies actually, they do not cost a lot of money, uh, but then there has to be a political will and commitment on the part of the government to enact these policies. Then after having discussed about the opportunities and challenges, the one final point that I want to mention and I, start, I will stop after that is the, the aspect of financing. Where will the resources come from? When we are talking about policies, they may not require that much of resources, but when we are talking about accessibility and affordability, um, in particularly accessibility, financing would be required in order to provide higher coverage, higher electricity coverage, or higher, um, let's say, broadband coverage. So therefore, you know, private sector needs to be brought in, and this is something that we discussed throughout this week, but then uh, development partners should also provide public resources to, for instance, such as aid for trade resources to capitalize um, the private funding, well, or other kinds of funding such as innovative sources of funding, impact investment, blended finance, and others. I can give you one example of impact investment. Uh, there's a there's a there's a fund called impact investment fund called Dolma Fund in in Nepal, which has provided support to technology related companies, including the example of Cloud Factory that I provided mm -hmm. earlier, to Cloud Factory, as well as to uh, an e-commerce platform called Sastrogin. So there are um, you know, enterprises or impact investors who would be willing to provide support to enhance the digital capabilities of LDCs, and those resources need to be tapped in order to um, help LDCs to advance on the digital journey. I stop here. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Radnakar, and uh, very interesting uh, that uh, you highlight the issues of accessibility, affordability, and financing. And in particular, that you have mentioned the issue of uh, open source, uh, open data, uh, that is uh, one of the major constraints uh, for uh, LDCs to adopt uh, uh, technologies uh, uh, from the frontier. Uh, on digital transformation and productive transformation. Um, so now we have the uh, uh, um, a keynote presentation uh, by uh, Tom Born Fredrickson, uh, head of e-commerce and digital economy branch at UNTAC. And we have a guiding question. And the guiding question is what major challenges and opportunities do you see in the adoption of digital technology in LDCs? And what are the major trends influencing the development of the digital economy in this country? Uh, before you answer, so I want to say that uh, uh, Tom von Fredrickson is the head of the e-commerce and digital economy branch uh, at UNTAC. And the branch has a very important work on the digital uh, economy report, the E-Trade for All initiative, E-Trade for Women, and the e-commerce week, and also provides capacity building services. Uh, Tom has also uh, led uh, a recent report uh, on digital transformation and LDCs. Uh, uh, so, Tom, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marco. <clears throat> it's you can't be with us here. Nice to see you. Um, and a big thank you to uh, the Technology Bank and also to Unido for allowing us this opportunity to share some of our insights on um, this very important topic. What I would like to do is to build on what the Ratnakar presented here and give some numbers, perhaps, uh, big pictures on what's really going on in LDCs compared to uh, the rest of the world. And I'm going to ask uh, my colleague there to run the slides for me because I understand they are also shown uh, over the Zoom. So, next slide, please. Yeah, that's Marco. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. And we can put it on, on display. And we can keep it on. Slideshow and next slide, please. This is uh, about technology. 
this session and uh, it shows that there is still uh, uh, work for improvement uh, in running the <laughs> digital technologies. Uh, yeah. Ah, oh, there we go. Very good. Yes, so it is there, it is there. But uh, for us, uh, it's not okay. Very good. So uh, if you look at this slide, I just want to show one thing. You can see a series of technological revolutions that we have experienced since the 18th century. And uh, the main takeaway is to see how the upper line is evolving compared to the lower line. Uh, and the upper line is the core uh, of the economy. And then the uh, lower line is periphery. And what you can see here that as we move forward in these technological revolutions, the gap is widening. So this is, uh, while it creates many new opportunities to develop the level of inequality between countries is actually expanding. Next slide, please. Now, what we're seeing in the uh, case of the fourth industrial revolution, e-commerce and digital economy, that there are a number of different kinds of technologies involved. And what is important here is that all of them uh, are and the way we use them uh, are impacting on our ability to achieve the sustainable development goals. All of the sustainable development goals from one to seventeen, uh, and uh, uh, sometimes these new technologies are making it easier to achieve the goals. Sometimes they are making it more difficult, and um, uh, therefore the policies are, of course, the crucial thing here to really try to harness the opportunities and mitigate the risks. Next slide. So we are starting here with very large digital devices. Despite the fact that more and more people are coming online, there are still 2.7 billion not online yet, according to ITU statistics. Uh, and uh, if you look at the um, uh, LDCs, still one third of the population are not using the, uh, the internet. But beyond that, we can also see that the level of speed of the interact internet connections that are being used in different parts of the world varies a lot. In least developed countries, uh, an average internet user uses about 40 um, uh, kilobits per second as compared with 680 in developed. So it's not just whether you have access, what kind of access do you have? On top of that, we have, of course, uh, big differences in terms of purchasing power. Uh, if you look at the low-income countries, 45% of the population still is uh, in extreme poverty, whereas in the upper the middle income, only 2% are. So we have all these dimensions to keep in mind as we talk about the device. Next slide, please. Uh, Ratnakar also referred to uh, the affordability of connectivity, and here are just some as a slide from and some examples from the Pacific that we uh, released the Pacific Digital Economy Report just two weeks ago. And for example, uh, the cost of a mobile subscription uh, costs four times more in the Pacific cities than in uh, uh, the world as a whole, on average. And if you take in a country like Kiribati, and uh, the cheapest smartphone costs about 50% of a monthly uh, GNI, which is tremendously prohibitively expensive. And this is also something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. Now, beyond the connectivity divide, we also have the use divide. And this can be very well illustrated with electronic commerce. And uh, if we see that in developed countries, about 60% of the population already buy things online. In least developed countries, that share is only 5% on average. There are, of course, examples and differences between the, the uh, least developed countries, but in most countries, uh, on the LDC group, it's only 5%. And another thing to observe in this slide is that while we saw that during COVID, the share of people going online and the share of people doing uh, telework and using digital solutions increased around the world, the increase was bigger in the more advanced economies. So as a result, the gap between the LDCs and other parts of the world actually widened, despite progress uh, in that number. Next slide, please. One of the key drivers of the digital economy and what is extremely important for, for the fourth industrial revolution is the growing importance of data. And here I'm talking about data that are generated from anything we do on the internet. And if you look at this chart here, it shows that 
1992, uh, data traffic was about 100 gigabytes per day. 10 years later, it was 100 gigabytes per second. And 2017, there were 46,000 gigabytes per second. And in 2022, 150,000 gigabytes per second. And we are still only in the early days of the digital economy and the <laughs> industrial revolution. As we see growing uptake of Internet of Things, 5G technology, more people are coming online, artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. We can expect that this trend will uh, further continue. Next slide, please. Now, data as such is not so interesting from the, from the prospects of generating either private value or social value. It's only when you transform the raw data into something that you can monetize or something that can inform policy makers' decisions and, and so on to that you create the value. So that means that it becomes extremely important to have access and control of the data and the data flows. And then the ability and capacity to transform the data to build something that is of value. So what we are saying here, it's extremely important that when we talk about the implications of digitalization, we need to increasingly move away from just usage and consumption to production and value creation and innovation based on the digitalization. This is uh, with a view to pr promote value creation. Next slide, please. So we are now in the process in the UN, uh, a unique opportunity to see how we can better harness digital for development. This is led by the uh, Tech Envoy's office in collaboration with the um, office of the president of the General Assembly. And it is uh, galvanizing a consultation process around the global digital compact. And the consultation process mm -hmm. running until the end of March, and then there will be a process continuing until the SDG summit in September, when a proposal will be presented. And after that, there will be negotiations on this global digital compact that will run until the summit of the future next year in September. It's extremely important that the least developed countries get their voice heard in this process so that it's not dominated by the ones that are relatively well advanced, but the ones that have the greatest need for digital information. From our perspective, it's in two key areas. One is to support the building of capacities and capabilities in the countries, infrastructure, skills, legal frameworks, policies, and so on. And secondly, to include, to include the least developed countries in processes at the global level, when we talk about how to govern data and digital in the world. Right now, very few people have to see that the same way. Next slide, please. A quick uh, reference to what UNCLED is doing in building the capabilities of developing countries, especially least developed countries, in the area of e-trade readiness is what we call the e-trade readiness assessments. We have done 24 such for LDCs, and we are also supporting in the follow-up stage, which is extremely important. And uh, next slide, please. And we're doing this not alone, but in a close collaboration with our partners in the e trade for all initiative. I'm very happy to have UNIDO, to have uh, the Enhanced Ready Framework, uh, ITU, ITC, and uh, another 30 partners in this initiative. It's a very complex effort to prepare for e commerce, for pre prepare for the digital economy, and to prepare for the fourth industrial revolution because it covers so many different policy areas. That also means that we need to join forces and connect the dots on the development partner side so that we don't create duplication of work, that we find synergies and make effective use of very scarce resources in these areas. So let me conclude with a few comments. Uh, what we see coming out, we see that MDCs have fallen further behind in the digital economy during COVID-19. There is an even greater need for capacity building and multi-stakeholder cooperation in this field to make progress. And we see a greater need for cooperation in all dimensions. And we need to see greater interministerial cooperation and multi-stakeholder dialogue in the LDCs themselves 
to make sure that the right policies are adopted. There is no time to waste. We have a lot to do. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Tom. Um, uh, this is a very interesting and very comprehensive presentation. And thank you for highlighting the efforts and the work that uh, the, the UN system is doing with the Office of the Tekken Boy on supporting the Global Digital Compact. And I think it's essential uh, that we emphasize in this exercise uh, the role and the position of LDCs as well. Uh, I just want to mention that in addition to the Global Digital Compact, there is a blueprint. And, and this blueprint uh, is open, will be open for consultation of member states and different stakeholders. And, and we invite everybody to, to make contributions to this, to this main document that will be discussed by member states uh, this year and next year during the summit of the future. Uh, so now we uh, start the part two, that are the approaches for LDCs to tackle the challenges and the different bottlenecks and the constraints uh, on advancing uh, uh, in the digital transformation agenda in LDCs. And we have uh, Lasila Kone, Director General and Chief Executive Officer of Smart Africa. And the guiding question is, is what actions, programs, initiatives, the LDC governments are undertaking or should undertake to benefit uh, the opportunities of the four industrial revolution. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Marco. Uh, wish, of course, that you are here. Uh, propelling, and thank you very much, uh, Unido, for inviting Smart Africa to be part of this panel. And it's really a great honor for us. Uh, next slide, please. Basically, the new story about Africa, uh, as you know, Africa is the youngest continent in the world. There's a new story about it. What we actually think or we actually thought uh, is a bit different because if you look at it, really six out of 10 fastest growing economy today, I say in Africa, I'm approaching the LDC in the African perspective and five out of the 10 top performer by the World Bank in doing business were also in Africa. This is for a simple reason that we have a rapid adoption of digital mobile technology. In fact, Africa is the mobile first continent Africa control about 70% transactions in mobile uh, technology, mobile money in case, and 60% uh, of mobile money value. This is the reason because we have a very young population. For example, if you pick a country like Indonesia, the median age is about 15 years old. So we have close to 70% of our uh, population uh, below 30 years old. Next slide, please. So why do we need a single digital market? It's a very intriguing question. Uh, if we look at the, uh, with all what uh, uh, Ratna, uh, Ratnakar and uh, Frederick Sund mentions, uh, I am completely aligned with that. The growth is in Africa. Africa has seen for the past five years, more than 45% compounded annual growth rate uh, in the internet. And uh, it's projected to be 180 billion by 2025. Uh, this is because of the market size, the total populations, and the young populations. Yes, we have uh, challenges which are like the uh, digital connectivity and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. These challenges come at a very high cost. Uh, if you look at the African continent, we have over 50 countries with over 50 digital legal, uh, digital legal and regulatory environment limited uh, across uh, country infrastructure, of course, and we have a digital market are largely national. Everyone look at Africa, either through Kenya, 48 million, or Ghana, 30 million, Cote d'Ivoire, 30 million, close to that. But we're not really looking at the uh, uh, Africa as the whole uh, market of 1.3 billion. And low level of digital skill, this is actually shared with uh, the rest of the LEC uh, around our planet. And uh, if you look at the intra-trade in Africa, uh, it represents only 18%, while in the EU it represents close to 69%. So these are the really challenges. And the challenge, these challenges are opportunity. So Smart Africa mandate is really to unlock these potentials through a single digital market with a vision to transform Africa into a single digital market by 2030, which is 30 years from now. The mission, very important, is to drive Africa's agenda, digital agenda, using a bold and innovative multi-stakeholder approach. 
in the ecosystem we are living, there is no way you can do it alone. Next slide, please. This mandate was actually given in the beginning by seven head of the state back in uh, 2013. In fact, this year we celebrated 10 years anniversary. It was uh, by the uh, president of Mali, Ibeka, and president Uru Pineta of Kenya, and president uh, Blessed Compare Burkina Faso, the president uh, Paul Kagame, his excellence of Paul Kagame of Rwanda, and Salaki of, uh, uh, of uh, South Sudan and uh, Museveni of uh, Uganda, and uh, also uh, uh, president of Bongo of uh, Gabon, with just five manifesto. One is to put the ICT at the center of our social economic development, to face the fourth industrial revolutions. And number two is to actually to improve access to uh, the broadband, especially what we're living today. And number three is to improve accountability and transparency in our government. Number four, very important, is to put this private sector first. It means that the head of the state to realize that the government should be creating a conducive environment for private sector to prosper. And number five, the last is to leverage ICT, to leverage ICT to promote sustainable uh, development. Next slide, please. Today, the alliance has grown to 36 country members. Our recent members are Nigeria and Malawi. Now we are representing more than 1.1 1, uh, 1. 1 billion populations uh, and growing. Next slide, please. And equally, Partners and private sector members, you know, have grown up as well. We have over 50. We have African Union and ITU, which are permanent member of Postman Africa. We have a private sector member, Platinum, Gold, Silver, and Academy, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. And the international also, we uh, our vision is in line with our partners in international organizations, such as the uh, African Union, the European Union, the Rad Norwegian Development Agency, BMW. Is the German development agency and so on and so forth. Really, the agility lies in the governance structure adopted to agile transformation. Basically, we have an organ, the main organ represented by head of the state. They meet every year once board, and we have a steering committee made of private sector and the public sector. We have the secretariat that I am honored to, to run. And we have a consultative organ, which are really the engines of Smart Africa, namely Council of ICT Ministers. They meet three to four times a year. And we have also uh, CAR, Council of African Regulators, which are very important, and Council of African IT Agency. Not forgetting that we have a private sector forum also that we uh, meet. We just met uh, last week in Barcelona. Next slide. Joining Smart Africa is not just a name. You join it through uh, by choosing a flagship flagship project. For example, we've seen for the past years, Kenya was leading digital economy, which was replicated in the Sierra Leone. Rwanda was running smart villages, and uh, South Africa was running artificial intelligence and uh, blockchain. Tunisia was running, for example, uh, Startup Act and uh, Burkina Faso ICT skills, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. These are just to give you an example. When the country joined, they actually joined with the flagship, and we work with the with the, with the country to develop a uh, uh, concept notes and blueprint that I will talk about. Next slide, please. Now, filling LDCs into the digital area. There are about four LDCs that we see. Say three of them actually are in Africa, and uh, the last conference happened ten years ago. And the overarching objective, of course, we all know it's uh, each conference is to set 10 years program of actions, which actually mean we need to walk our power. 10 countries graduated in the last 30 years. Mean we, if we continue moving the same pace, we will need close to 90 years the remaining countries in Africa to graduate. It basically means what we've been doing over the past uh, 60 some years is not working. We need to be looking a different way. How do we do this? Next slide, please. A bold, innovative approach is needed. Smart Africa at the center, we have a country members who are member, we have international institution partners, we have international development partners, we have private sector partners. When they join, when the country has a flagship and we pick the working group and the working group from there, we work from a concept note to a blueprint to pilot the projects. Once the project is piloted, and uh, the who actually is with the pilot, it's a private sector, but the benefit really goes to the country. Suddenly, 
you are putting a spotlight in emerging technology in the country because we all know, although the digital economy is a transversal, but it's not really a top priority in every single LDC country. So some of these pilots can be nationally significant, sometimes it can be cross-border significant, for example, cross-border cross uh, projects in Africa. Then we form a special purpose vehicle to, this, uh, to scale up this project, which of course will eventually create jobs and sustainable development and so on and so forth. And this is our development model. Next slide, please. This slide is to show you the flagship project are all right, the three main focus, which is to connect, innovate, and transform. And we need the connectivity to build infrastructure resilient, and we need to innovate. Innovate basically means not only innovation in technology, innovation of financing, innovation of thinking, and transformation. Basically, we need to look at the, how we can capitalize on the technology to move forward. 2020, let's say, starting 2020, we only have that time 15 in strategic planning and three in implementation. If you go to the next slide, you can see exactly how this all this project has moved to into we have about 12 projects now in the strategic planning and 22 in implementation. It means the model is actually working. And each of these projects, of course, is led by an LDC or a non LDC country uh, located in Africa. Next slide, please. These are some of the examples of what we actually delivered and they're ready to pilot. We have, for example, Startup Act, the Smart Cities, and we have uh, a Smart City by Rwanda. We have ICT, uh, ICT Startup by Tunisia. We have a broadband by Senegal, broadband uh, strategy 2025, Smart Villages by Niger, the digital identity by Benin. We have digital economy by Kenya, digital payment by Ghana. We have ICT skill by Burkina Faso, hybrid tech by Zimbabwe, artificial intelligence by South Africa. Next slide, please. Another example of pilot, the Smart Africa Trust Alliance. There is no digital transformation if there is no digital ID, because you are not going to log in into government services using uh, social media emails. And this ID is very important. I know it's a very key project for UN. It's addressing a lot of things. And we, are, we have an initiative led by Benin working on that. Next slide, please. The digital ID project actually called us to create a smart Africa trust alliance, which is an integrated user centric national framework, a continental framework for different uh, unique identification number in the countries, LDC countries, to be able to interoperate with each other, service based approach, basically. Next slide, please. And uh, this is uh, another pilot, which is a startup act, uh, where we also develop already. We help countries, assist countries to put together a legislation for our startup. And we develop operational toolkit as well for the development of the post-startup policies in Africa. Next slide, please. Another pilot of the which is Agritech in uh, Zimbabwe. We've developed a blueprint from concept to blueprint. Now we're piloting agricultural information management system with the uh, Zimbabwe government. Next slide, please. This is another pilot that we actually deliver, smart cities uh, and ready to scale up. Uh, basically, smart waste management for sustainable development. And this has been uh, developed from a concept all the way to pilot. Today is taken over by a private sector, which is running it on a public service concession to private sector. Next slide, please. Another example of scale up, which is the Smart Africa Digital Academy. It's very important to be, in order to be transformed, you have to be informed. That's the reason 18 months ago, Smart Africa embarked on the Smart Africa Digital Academy. So far, we have trained more than 3,200 decision makers. We're talking director of cabinet, chief of staff, regulatory, uh, regulatory environment. And we have a 12 country who actually adopted in country national digital academy. This is from 30 different countries out of 36 uh, members of Smart Africa. We do that together with the more than 28 partners, private sector partners, and institutional partners. Next slide, please. An example of another scale up project is the Smart Africa Scholarship Fund. Uh, four years ago, we raised a fund to about $1.6 million. We were able to finance 82 students in Africa with a master's degree from Carnegie Mellon University in Rwanda and also ESMT. Ecole Management Education au Senegal, in Senegal. So they are all working in Africa from 15 different countries. 40% are women. Next slide, please. 
It's good to talk about digital transformation. We can talk about digital transformation without talking about funds for our startup. So Smart Africa, we created Block Smart Africa funds, which is being managed in Luxembourg. And Cote d'Ivoire, this, this fund actually call up for a contribution from each country. It's a blended financing uh, to raise about 100 million dollars, 800 million euros. So Cote d'Ivoire, I request, has already contributed, and Luxembourg also has Niger. So last year, we were able to invest in five different uh, startups in Africa uh, from five different countries. Next slide, please. To end this one, I would like to say that propelling the LDC is really in digital area. First of all, it starts with the transformation of mindset. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Lacina. Very interesting, very comprehensive presentation. And thank you for sharing uh, the, the different uh, pilot projects that you're implementing across the region. And I think we tend to forget uh, that uh, uh, as you mentioned, six of the 10 fastest growing economies are in Africa. No? Uh, and, and so this is important, important information. Uh, and, and, and we have to pay attention to what is being done there. And uh, you also mentioned about the need to have a single digital market. Uh, so now we have Anir Shoduri, a policy advisor uh, from Aspire to Innovate program. ICT division and cabinet division of the government of Bangladesh uh, from UNDP Bangladesh. And the guiding question is, from your experience, what are the major obstacles that enterprises in the LDCs face in undergoing the digital transformation? Thank you, Marco. Uh, let me take you back about 15 years uh, when Bangladesh started its digital Bangladesh journey, an analog country, less than 1% internet penetration. And in terms of uh, delivery of public services, we maybe have had about maybe 10 services delivered uh, digital and thousands of services. We have about 2,500 services that we're delivering to citizens. And almost all of it was obviously done uh, on paper, over the counter, using cash. Um, so that was the situation we started with. Uh, and uh, we did, when the Prime Minister announced the concept of digital Bangladesh uh, in 2008, uh, we did a series of workshops in 2009 and uh, maybe about 400 departments of the government. And uh, essentially uh, we had, Proposals like, okay, we will open up a website that's digital. We'll uh, open email because we don't have email. So, so that was the discussion we had uh, in 2009. Uh, fast forward uh, 14, 15 years. Now we have uh, close to 67% internet penetration in the country. Uh, even rural areas have uh, uh, internet penetration. We have what are called digital centers, about 9,000 centers across the country, uh, which act as a go-between uh, between the analog citizens who don't have access, who may not be able to pay for it, who don't have the skills via the internet or the smartphones. So these digital centers actually support them. These digital centers uh, work as entrepreneurship, uh, uh, locations in government offices. So it's a very unique, unique public-private partnership. About 6 million people visit these centers. We did a calculation of how many services in the last uh, decade plus we uh, digitized within the government. And uh, we saw that close to 2,000 services. So about 80% uh, of the services have been digitized. And uh, uh, we see about uh, 6 billion services have been delivered electronically in the last decade or so saving citizens about $22 billion. It's a massive change. And I think uh, uh, my colleague from Smart Africa, he ended with mindset change. I think that was the key thing, that that's what happened. Now, let me talk about uh, fourth industrial revolution. So we did a series of workshops uh, the last uh, couple of years, uh, led by our cabinet, cabinet office. Uh, on 4 IR. So as we're talking about fourth industrial revolution technology and uh, Ratnakar gave us a very interesting uh, look into AI and blockchain and drone and cloud computing, how this is being used 
in different countries. So we did, uh, we went to similar uh, officers, just as we did in 2009, and we asked them, okay, what, what are you going to do with 4 iron? And remember, I talked about what was opening email account was digital. I mean, that was the thinking. And now they said that, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. So the Bangladesh Rice Research Institute is using artificial intelligence uh, for doing pest management. So they actually take pictures of uh, pest uh, infected, infested uh, crops and they feed it into an AI system. And the AI actually tells them what measures to take. Um, uh, our Department of Fisheries is using uh, IoT-based devices for automated fish farming. So see what has changed. It's really a mindset shift that has happened in the last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, we also announced uh, a challenge competition. So we talked about blockchain here. Uh, we have a challenge competition on blockchain. And the, the winning idea was using blockchain to trace uh, where leather is coming from, because our leather industry is facing a crisis in just exporting leather, leather goods, uh, because uh, the buyers want to know where this leather has come from, what the cow actually ate. So that's the tracing that, that's being used for leather industry. Uh, uh, the food industry is using similar tracing. So we are now going into this challenge competition to develop uh, blockchain-based uh, tracing, traceability apps. Um, we have a challenge competition for health uh, to monitor the health of uh, pregnant women. And again, wearable computing is coming into. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that we're actually seeing in terms of implementation, in terms of ideas. We're working with Google. Uh, we gave Google 10 years of water data. And Google uses its uh, AI engine to give us better flood forecasting. So this is happening in, on a pilot basis in Bangladesh and in India right now. And there is an example that we have adopted from Togo, a small country, but a brilliant example that we have identified, which will really help us. We haven't implemented it, but it's really identifying people's poverty status by looking at their phone usage. This professor at the University of California, Berkeley, has developed an algorithm uh, using 960 different parameters. Uh, so length of a call, time of call, top-ups, SMS, I mean, all kinds of things. To understand people's poverty status on a real-time basis. So think about what it would do to do uh, real-time targeting of poor people, which we needed during COVID, and we didn't have this technology. So we used it during COVID, and they actually tried this on 100,000 people. So if we can actually perfect this in Bangladesh with, with about 25 million people who are uh, under social safety net, then we can figure out on an ongoing basis who needs support and who has, well, may have graduated already, but they're still supporting them. Now we're working with Red Cross to take this a level further by combining what we learned from Togo and what we did with Google is that uh, anticipatory disaster response. So we know that which households will be flooded based on Google's information. So if you can provide them with support ahead of time, ahead of the flood, because Bangladesh is a flood prone area, we have seen that the resilience goes up tremendously. If they have food support, cash support before flood happens, as opposed to after the flood. So again, uh, AI and anticipation. The Red Cross does something similar in analog format, but now we're combining digital to make this uh, even much more powerful. So these are the kinds of things that we have actually seen happening in just a little over a decade in terms of government's mindset and uh, enterprises are also participating in this. So they're seeing this uh, groundswell support for new innovations, new technologies, and 4IR is really making a big difference here. Uh, let me talk about uh, skills a little bit, uh, which is very important from a fourth industrial revolution perspective. We did a study in 2019 on what 4IR really represents as opportunity and also as challenge. So I talked about the opportunities. It actually has revolutionize the way we deliver public services and work with the enterprises, the opportunity that enterprises are seeing. These new enterprises, uh, tech companies, health, fintech, agrotech, so they're all coming together using all these new technologies uh, to uh, support public services. But the big threat is in the skills mix. So as uh, routine jobs are being automated, now, I mean, chat GPT is automating even white coffee shops also. So I won't go into the debate of that. 
But essentially, uh, a lot of jobs will actually be eliminated. So in 2019, we did a study on five sectors, uh, some of the most important sectors in the country, uh, garments, leather, agro-food, hospitality, others. And we saw that if we don't upgrade, if we don't upskill our people, we lose about 5.5 million jobs in the next decade or so. But uh, if we upskill, obviously those jobs will be done by humans on top of the machines. So the machines will do the routine ones and then we'll actually have uh, more value additions by human beings. So that's a very important area. And we started working with our, with our technical education board and uh, a very concerted effort has happened and COVID in a, in a very strange sense has really brought a new sense of urgency because COVID showed us what can change and how quickly it can change. 4IR, we, we talked about 4IR since uh, World Economic Forum introduced the term, Mr. So Schwab introduced the term maybe in 2016. We read that book that he published and then the second book that he published we we're talking about 4 IR, and we said, okay, things will change maybe on a yearly basis. But COVID showed us that they actually change on a weekly basis. So the rate of change has has, I think it's it's astronomical. And we could not even comprehend it before COVID. So COVID really brought us that sense of urgency. I think that was in a sense helpful to for that mindset, mindset shift. Uh, so we are actually coming up with new curriculum. And that's an integrated effort between the private sector and government, and also the training providers. So we have developed a, a technology platform called NICE, National Intelligence for Skills, Education, Employment, and Entrepreneurship. It's called NICE Cubed. So that's a data platform. We talked about data quite a bit. The data is coming in from the 40 different uh, uh, industry associations, 23 different ministries who are involved in skills development in Bangladesh, and also the training providers. There are 12,000 uh, 12, uh, specific training providers in Bangladesh uh, uh, across the entire country doing their own silo thing. So they're all connected to this. Uh, some are not connected, they will be connected to the an effort of the prime minister's office that we support. And uh, it's bringing everybody together to understand. So we're trying to build a crystal ball as, as much as we can. Uh, I'll end with a few things that, that I think are going to be important. So in terms of policy, I think, uh, uh, Ratnagar, you talked about how we need to have the right policies in place. So ICT policy, uh, we have e-commerce policy. We are also looking at specific industrial policies to support enterprises and the government, such as electronic vehicle policy, because we're developing electronic vehicles in Bangladesh right now. They're completely unregulated, causing all sorts of accidents. Uh, so we don't want to stifle innovation. We want to develop policy to support local industry development and uh, try to do import substitution as much as possible. But even more importantly, I would say, policies are not enough because policies are documents and it doesn't really change mindsets. Uh, so we need to have the right incentive structure in place. So a few things that I'd like to end on. The first one is to understand the horizon, where, where things are moving and how quickly it's moving. So that's what we call horizon scanning. Uh, so our 2019 report just before COVID really gave us this horizon of how 4 IR will shift things and COVID accelerated that. So that's the first thing. Second is really a visioning exercise coupled with a few quick win ideas. So the 4 IR workshop that I talked about that we did in the last couple of years generated about 1,200 quick win ideas. Not all of them will be pursued, but it has actually created a deeper understanding of what 4 IR will do in terms of fisheries, in terms of agriculture, in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of disaster management, and so on and so forth. So hundreds of uh, officers along with industry partners have worked on these ideas. And we'll probably see about 50 being launched this year. Many of them will fail, but it doesn't matter because this experimentation is absolutely necessary. Policies cannot replace experimentation. Um, so that's the second thing, visioning and quick win experimentation. Third is really uh, sticks and carrots that we have to put in place. So in terms of carrots, we have recognition, reward, uh, innovation awards that the prime minister gives out at the end of the year. So those are very helpful uh, in terms of uh, sticks, we have this thing called the annual performance agreement that the cabinet office signs with every blind ministry. 
And we actually put four IR into that annual performance agreement so that each ministry has to trigger at least one four IR project and demonstrate how services are actually going to be improved in, in partnership with the private sector. Uh, so that brings me to the fourth point, public-private partnership. Because without public-private partnership, a lot of these things actually will not happen. So private sector has to have the space to support experimentation and also make money. So I think that's very important. Uh, and the fifth point, which I'll end with, is really South-South cooperation. Uh, we've heard a lot about South-South cooperation uh, in the LDC5 conference in the last uh, few days. Uh, however, I think uh, a lot of emphasis was on lessons learned and lessons sharing. But I think that's not enough because lessons don't change behavior, right? In behavior change, you actually have to apply it. You have to take things. Uh, we're, we're not saying that we will reinvent the wheel, but we will take things from country A and apply it to country B in the context of country B. So you have to customize a lot, and that requires financing. So innovative financing for South-South cooperation and triangular cooperation will also have to be uh, very important. So, uh, so uh, that's, that's about it for now. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Anir, for describing the efforts in Bangladesh and the uh, integrated uh, policies uh, with education, health, productive transformation in the different areas. So this is really something uh, that can be scaled up uh, to other uh, places and, and, and regions. Uh, so now uh, we have uh, Rasigan uh, Marajaf, uh, Director of the Institute for Economic Research on Innovation in the Faculty of Economics and Finance at Suwane University of Technology in South Africa. Yeah, I see he just uh, chat me that uh, uh, he lost electricity and is connecting, is connecting uh, with his uh, cell phone. Uh, and the guiding question is, uh, what are the major obstacles that enterprises in LDCs may face for digital transformation and probably electricity is the first one. <laughs> so please, uh, Rasikan, the floor is yours. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much. And thanks, colleagues. Uh, if you don't mind, Marco, can I just get an indication? Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, yes. Excellent. Clear. So thanks very much, colleagues. And thanks also for the presentations that were made before. I'm sorry to be presenting uh, in uh, such a romantic setting, but the ideas I'm going to present are not as romantic as uh, the setting may present itself as. I've, I've structured my uh, intervention uh, on the topic to uh, respond to Marco's question as innovation ecosystems of Africa, the challenges of sectors, skills, and creative destruction. And I've organized my uh, intervention in five sections. Uh, the five sections comprise a logic, which I think is quite important for us to appreciate as much as the data that I will also be sharing with you. I'm going to start with a few comments about our contemporary conjuncture that picks up on some of what the colleagues had mentioned earlier, but maybe also uh, challenges some of the assumptions that underpin uh, how we understand where we are at present. From there, I want to move towards technological change and creative destruction by emphasizing the state of science, technology, and innovation in Africa itself. I want to make a few points about the sustainable development goals, in particular, our performance, and this is from a regional perspective. And I want to get then to ICTs in Africa uh, as a snapshot to bring you to the answers to the questions. Uh, as Marco has indicated, uh, South Africa is in a national state of disaster. And the president of the Republic introduced the national state of disaster on the basis of us not having universalized electricity access. So people are well aware of the fact that there are over 600 million people in the world without electricity access. I'm, I live in a country of 61 million people. I sorely hope we're not adding another 10% uh, to the number itself and that we are able to resolve this. So when we look at um, 2022, and I'm sure colleagues are aware of uh, the compilation done through the World Bank and IMF, that basically suggested our economy in terms of output measured through gross domestic product had reached 100 trillion US dollars. Uh, it's important in recognizing inside that 
very large scale, 100 trillion US dollars, Africa's contribution is less than 3%. In fact, from the uh, numbers that we've seen, it's at the level of 2.8%. And here, it's hugely uneven because three main economies, and uh, I uh, mentioned them in rank order, Nigeria, Egypt, and South Africa, comprise the overwhelming majority even of that 2.8% in world terms. The strong contrast there is that Africa currently comprises 17% of the world's population. And here is a major disjuncture between the quality of life experience by 1.4 billion people uh, versus what's available to us globally. If we consider a global knowledge commons, we are not benefiting as a continent from the very significant advances being achieved globally. So I want to make a few points then about how we translate uh, technical change through creative destruction. And here I'm gonna draw on the work of Pier Pablo Saviotti, and who said that the study of technological changes poses some fundamental challenges to our understanding or analysis of socioeconomic realities. It's quite important recognizing that technological innovation leads to qualitative changes. In other words, it's through the introduction of technical, what we can call even general purpose technologies, that a whole range of new entities, qualitatively different from those that preceded them, are able to be induced into the economy and bring about significant changes to the composition of the entire economic system. It's also important recognizing that the new outputs that originate through the introduction of new technologies also spark new activities and new actors. So there are massive beneficiaries possible through the introduction of new technologies, but these new technologies have to be built on the basis of a firm and solid uh, bedrock of supporting infrastructures. And herein lies the rub itself. So while there are other aspects of innovation, there's social innovation, there's innovation in legal terms, in terms of the laws. I think the colleague from Africa had earlier mentioned over 50 different systems that need to be in somehow harmonized and also organizational change. All of these changes contribute to improving what's taking place in the sector. So how do we know what's happening in science and technology in Africa as a whole? Well, of course, we could look at the scientometric data that gets produced by sister organizations or fraternal organizations such as UNESCO, et cetera. But it's been very difficult because of the quality of data available to us. So we started a project uh, uh, trying to promote and establish indicators for science and technology across Africa. It's called the African Innovation Outlook Series. And the, uh, which is owned by the African Union Development Agency, NAPAD. When we started this project in 2010, we had approximately 17 uh, countries uh, of Africa submitting uh, survey results. As of 2019, this number had increased massively. So now we have nearly all 55 countries of Africa's data we have some difficulties with the quality of the data, so we are in the process of harmonizing them. So I'm going to share with you just some of the highlights that come from the data that has already been through quality and peer review. So gross domestic expenditure on R&D gives us a sense of the actual commitment, not merely the rhetoric or the policy framework, but actually how much governments are spent, and the government, the countries are spending and investing in research and development. So according to those numbers, as a percentage of GDP, no country in Africa has reached what's called the 1% mark. In fact, the closest that we get based on the data uh, boils down to South Africa in 2019, achieving 0.7% of GDP. Uh, amongst the countries that gave us good quality data, the worst performing was Uganda at 0.18%. So I hope people are getting a sense that notwithstanding the fact that it's often recognized, Africa is not a single country, but uh, a diversity, a plur plurality of circumstances. We have huge unevenness amongst the countries that con uh, constitute Africa itself. 
when we look at uh, these, the gross domestic expenditure on the basis of the sectors that they support, and here the sectors as established through the Frascati framework is business, government, higher education, and private not-for-profit. When we look at the ratio between the spending in these sectors itself, whereas highly advanced, mature capitalist economies have a bigger share of business spending. In Africa, it remains dominated by government and higher education. And herein also lies further concerns with respect to the type of austerity regimes post COVID-19 that we are confronted by. Again, uh, it's South Africa that leads in terms of business expenditure at approximately 46% of the total spend. Botswana is the second at 18%, followed by Namibia at 11%. I'm raising this because huge economies, Egypt and Nigeria, have huge difficulties with encouraging the private sector business, as it's mentioned, to also co-invest in research and development to try and achieve the results we want. When we look at the uh, type of uh, research and development by type, that means between basic through to experimental development, we find the overwhelming majority is now firmly in applied sciences. Uh, uh, a small portion of resources still go into the basic sciences and experimental development is small. But the bulk, approximately 45% upwards, is spent on applied research, which has, again, huge potentials for us. This leads me to an important point, and I like the way our colleague from Bangladesh brought it back to the human beings that actually do the work, in other words, produce the labor. And that is the R&D personnel, who are the ones that constitute the spending. And here, again, the distribution of R&D personnel in Africa is at odds with those countries that are at the research frontier itself. By and large, the overwhelming majority of R&D personnel are either paid for by government or higher education. Business constitutes a smaller proportion uh, of uh, R&D personnel. By way of function, what we find again is that we have and very odd balance between researchers, technicians, and support staff. Yes. What we are seeing increasing, especially with uh, uh, increasing uh, monitoring of activities, that the support function uh, or the amount of expenditure on support functions is increasing. And this is th uh, through also uh, the need to maintain a range of precepts, including ethics and other uh, uh, qualifications on research. And this is increasing the stock of administrative staff as opposed to uh, research and or researchers themselves. So to sequay from that into SDG regional performance. And here, because this is within the UN family, I needn't go through the extreme detail. I'm sure all of you are aware of the huge setback in numbers of years that COVID-19 has placed on the world system as a whole. But in particular for Africa, this setback has been extremely significant. When we look at the, the report published at, in November 2022, which summarized SDG performance at that point, what we find is that for Sub-Saharan Africa, all of the 17 goals are listed as stagnating, except two. And those two are responsible consumption and production and climate action. Those are the ones where Africa is performing the best, but remember that's for the whole region and includes huge variety inside it. The key point being, these also give us a sense of orientation for the system. What is it that requires a developmental assistance? So I, need, I needn't share with you the performance of all 55 countries. It is available through the UN report itself, but it's quite important for us to draw upon this. The circumstances that occupy us and that we are occupied by may not necessarily be of our making primarily, but it is where we find ourselves. And we really need to pay much more attention to those circumstances, not just normative, where we'd love to be or like to be. I'd like to be in a place with electricity right now. It would make my job much easier. This is not where I am. I am where I am. And this is the circumstances that we operate within. 
I want to quote to you just the point made in the, world, uh, in the UN report, and that is that overall poorer countries, low income countries, low middle income countries, including most of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, as well as small island development state, face the largest SDG gaps. And then listed underneath this is a whole range of the challenges that have been compounded during COVID-19. Listed as number one is the question of uh, physical and digital and human infrastructures. And here we need to pay much more attention. The bottom line from that report really suggests strengthening public sector capacities as well as the statistical capacities uh, to remain major priorities in all these countries. So, from there, I want to shift very rapidly to the uh, data around internet usage in Africa. Colleagues are aware of this. I think some of the colleagues have presented. But here, I just want to share with you as well the differentiation, at least across the geographic regions uh, of the continent. In 2023, the largest proportion uh, of world users in Africa uh, were located in uh, um, um, what, what would be considered North, uh, North and Western Africa. That's 3.3% and 4% respectively. For the middle, Central Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa, we are dealing with 1.1%, 2.1%, and 0.9%. That's an extremely small proportion of the world uses itself. When we look at the absolute numbers, in other words, those non-users in millions of people, Central Africa is 143.4 million people who are not using the internet. East Africa is 368 million and Southern Africa 20.3. These are huge numbers, and behind it, of course, lies huge amounts of possibilities and opportunities that arise from it. You know, uh, the colleague uh, also had mentioned uh, Africa being new. Africa is not new, colleagues, as you know. All of you sat wherever you are, are a product of Africa. We all come from Africa. It's the oldest in terms of the source of humanity. But in terms of technologies, we sometimes face these anew. So if we look Hello, at uh, uh, well, uh, it, so, sorry, Masigan, uh, can, can you can you wrap up in a couple of minutes? So sure, we sure. are approaching the end. Good. Yeah. So uh, the point I wanted to make is if you look at the growth from 1990, 1995 to where we are at present, you see massive leaps. But uh, I want us to be quite careful about how we interpret these massive leaps forward they on the basis of a very low starting point. And that's something that still requires our attention. There are a range of issues the colleagues have raised already. I'm just going to mention them in terms of big heading. Structural mass unemployment remains a major issue for us. Of course, the digitally div uh, divided developing world and especially the challenges around South-South. Question of climate change and environmental impact, including the costs and uh, weight of electricity demands by the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution as well. There's rising cyber warfare, increasing civil and cross-border conflicts. We're currently facing a huge threat of xenophobia arising in Tunisia at present. These are part of the migrations that we are confronted by. So digital security risks are also improving. So by way of conclusion, and thanks, Marcus. I'm, I'm sorry I, I took so long. Yeah. The major obstacles that enterprises and LDCs face in undergoing the digital transformation. It's quite important in terms of the sectors as we know it itself, value chains, et cetera, that we are able to link the data that tells us about the functioning with the realities confronting the economies of Africa. We also need to deal with the fact that not all the data that we have to, available to us is of sufficient quality that we can build policy frameworks upon it. This means we have to do more work at improving that statistical functioning as well. In terms of skills, the issue and the gap between the formal economy and the informal economy can no longer continue to be trivialized. As you know, the really good development econo economist, Ha Jun Cheng, made this famous statement a while ago. There are more entrepreneurs in Africa than the rest of the world, but we are not identified as such. Why? Because survival takes so much. 
So we need to redress this. Underemployment and unemployment continues, especially at the graduate level. And that's something that we continue, uh, cannot continue just adding to. So if you don't mind, Marcos, I know we're in the year 2023, but the answer to the last part of that under innovation, I want to quote to all of us something from 1532. And it was written well before digitalization, as we know it today. It was Machiavelli's answer to the, uh, in The Prince. And he said, innovation makes enemies of all those who prospered under the old regime. And only lukewarm support is forthcoming from those who would prosper under the new. This is a significant issue that we have to confront because vested interests still occupy the space. It's massively important that the youngest population is in Africa. And because of that, we have huge possibilities of working with this population in determining not only the Africa that we want, but the world that we want as well. Thank you very much for affording me the attention. Many thanks, many thanks, Rasigan, for very interesting uh, comments. Uh, so now uh, uh, we have Monse Soudani, uh, manager of Reverse Linkage Division. Cooperation and Capacity Development Department, Islamic Development Bank. And this is the, this is the uh, position, the role of the multilateral organizations. So in particular, uh, uh, we would like to ask you, uh, what uh, is the role uh, of National Digital Innovation Ecosystem in the LDCs? Thank you, Marco. And uh, we wish uh, that you were uh, with us uh, physically. And I would like to thank uh, UNIDO and uh, UNTB for the organization of this uh, event. Uh, the Islamic Development Bank is a multilateral development institution. Uh, it's all its member countries are coming from the south. We are, we are having 57 member countries. All of them are uh, from the south. So uh, through our DNA, our uh, South South uh, cooperation is in is in the process of actually developing our operation, our intervention, and is is within the philosophy of the bank to support uh, uh, its member countries. Uh, Mr. Shoudhury was talking uh, just just now about the importance of uh, uh, transfer of. Uh, of knowledge and uh, south south cooperation while doing the customization and taking into context the the the, the, the reality of all of the field uh, within the uh, within the bank we started doing south south and cooperation since early uh, uh, 1980 and uh, we, 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 through our experience we found out that uh, doing uh, South-South cooperation with a, uh, a small intervention here and there is good, but not not enough. So we developed a kind of uh, reverse uh, linkage mechanism where we are transferring expert, uh, expertise, knowledge, solution, technology uh, in a in a wide uh, aiming to have a kind of. Uh, Long, long term approach where we, we are transferring expertise while making a kind of customization uh, into the reality of, of the field and the, the context of the, of, of the recipient country. Uh, how we are doing that? We are, we are building on the, on the knowledge uh, of our member country uh, in, the, in the global south. Uh, we, we 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 started processing uh, actually the uh, reverse linkage intervention since uh, 2014, and uh, we did uh, we 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 succeeded to have a lot of uh, pilot intervention in our member country, and uh, where we are at the same time developing the capacity of. Uh, uh, of the institution in our member country and developing the infrastructure. Building on uh, that uh, success and on the importance of, uh, of uh, uh, capacity development of, of institution in our member country and uh, believing on, on the importance of, of technology, uh, we recently actually we, we, we started uh, brainstorming uh, on how to, 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 to 
to support the development of uh, science and technology while making a kind of customization and uh, find, finding innovative intervention. Of, of course, uh, we, we, are, we are a bank, we are giving uh, financing to develop infrastructure, but also we, we are a development institution. So when we are giving financing, we, we, we do care about the importance of sustainability, about the importance of uh, appropriation of our member country and about actually having uh, a win-win approach where all the stakeholders actually can can sustainably develop and have a long-lasting intervention and a long-lasting technology and infrastructure in, in in their country. So 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 it's very important to have financing. So financial uh, financial envelope is very important. But to, to, to find the adequate uh, financial me means. So it has to be concessional and it, ha it has to be uh, a focus on de developing, uh, I mean, uh, developing transfer of technology and deployment of technology. Uh, since uh, actually we notice that in, in our member country, we are facing most of the time two kinds of. Uh, uh, problem, the transfer of technology, and also if, if uh, we have that technology, its deployment within the country is very important, is also missing. So uh, we thought that to develop a kind of uh, a regional program where, where we, can, we can, as a bank, uh, give uh, loans uh, to the uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, in uh, depth debt financing when uh, when we are uh, where we are, are uh, developing the infrastructure to, to, to transfer and deploy technology but while doing that we are capitalizing on the expertise you know, of uh, our uh, member country or on uh, the, the, the i mean uh, all the stakeholders that they have uh, technology it can be from our member country or from outside but uh, the, the most important thing is to, to find a provider of expertise ready to share the, the, their knowledge, of course, in a win-win approach where everybody gains the provider of expertise uh, the, uh, and the provider of technology and the recipient of technology. So how we are, we, we are uh, going to, 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 I mean, to develop that or to, to, to pilot that, is uh, uh, is to make a kind of identification of of the the, the need in in a member country in terms of technology and based on the on the technology uh, requested uh, we are making a kind of matchmaking to find uh, the provider of expertise and to discuss uh, and uh, the provider of technology to discuss with them uh, in order to to make a kind of blending um, intervention where, where the bank will come with uh, its uh, uh, financial, uh, I mean, uh, hearts and also with uh, her uh, network and the provider of expert, uh, of uh, knowledge will, will, will come uh, and uh, technology will come with uh, its know-how in order to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to make a kind of uh, um, focus intervention and also with 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 that we, we, we are uh, having another uh, uh, let's say uh, stakeholder who, who is uh, uh, topping up the financing because it's very important actually the, that the provider of expertise uh, is uh, accompanied by by by, by uh, an institution uh, in addition to the bank, but an institution from the actually that can support the development of uh, and the financing of uh, this intervention. So uh, this is, will allow the bank to, to to have a kind of blending intervention when the bank. Uh, will give non uh, will give non grant financing 
and uh, the provider of expertise will support uh, and the uh, technology will support its intervention through uh, the know-how through uh, in-kind contribution and also will be having a kind of a third party, a party or a global fund who will be contributing also to to uh, to to reduce the cost of of the financing because we do believe that it's important uh, to 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 have a uh, uh, concessional financing to develop uh, transfer of, of expertise, but to do that in a very uh, systematic uh, manner where the, the ownership and commitment is there because we, without uh, commitment from uh, and ownership from the different stakeholders, uh, the transfer of, uh, uh, of uh, technology will fail. Uh, we, we need, we, we, are, we will be uh, doing that while uh, paying attention about uh, to, to have uh, an intervention and a financing affordable financing and also to, to, to have a kind of inclusive approach where everybody will be sitting together to, 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 to understand the problem uh, requested by uh, uh, country A in terms of uh, need, in terms of, of technology, and then we'll be making a kind of matchmaking between a different stakeholders in order to find the, find the, 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 right, uh, the right solution. Uh, and, uh, and the right solution will, uh, will be evaluated internally by the bank, but also externally by uh, a dedicated uh, stakeholder who ha has uh, has a certain reference in, in terms of, 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 of technology. Uh, in addition to, to that, we, we, we found that in our in our journey of, of the bank that uh, transfer of technology uh, can be done at different uh, uh, in a different area where it can be actually technology is there in ICT in agriculture in uh, education uh, in infrastructure so, so everywhere so we'll be intervening on, on, on this different uh, focus area. But in addition to that, I think we found that uh, uh, we can make a transfer of technology uh, while using South-South cooperation, while you uh, complementing that to North-South intervention or a triangular cooperation intervention. And also in some time, in some country that uh, we found that even we can deploy technology within the same country from the uh, capital city to the rural area because very often there is a mismatch uh, in our uh, member country in the level of technology between the capital cities and and uh, and the rural area and uh, uh, of course we are, we, we are leveraging in the, in the, in, the, in two aspects in the public sector, but also in the private sector, because technology uh, is available everywhere, and more and more, it's uh, we are, we are seeing that uh, the private sector are are there uh, actually to contribute more and more in a very comprehensive and sustainable approach to support other institutions to acquire technology. Uh, this is uh, will open for, for them a new uh, new business opportunity. And so we, we don't have to be shy when we are uh, developing actually as a MDBs to leverage on the on the private sector to support them in order to uh, to uh, develop uh, technology and to deploy technology in another uh, institute, uh, country. So it's a win-win approach where everybody uh, needs to work together to, to, to support the development of, uh, and the transfer of technology from, from uh, through our uh, member country. Uh, this is, uh, and as a takeaway, actually, I think it's very important to, to have, uh, to make a relevant 
uh, intervention to make it in uh, in a win-win approach and to to to, to have uh, uh, to develop the transfer and deployment of technology through uh, concessional financing, uh, so uh, and to develop the infrastructure of uh, of uh, for the uh, transfer of technology while developing the capacity of of uh, the stakeholders because without capacitation of the ecosystem for uh, technology, uh, our uh, the intervention it won't be sustainable. And uh, this is the quality, the sustainability is our uh, main objective as a, as a bank in terms of intervention for, for our member plan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Monsef, uh, many thanks. Uh, 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 we have reached the, the end of the event and then we don't have time for questions and answers, but uh, uh, let me tell you that there is a, a lot of rich information we are going to put together. And, uh, and produce a, a, a short summary uh, of this uh, SAI event and we are going to share with you uh, as well uh, with uh, uh, a, a different social media available. So many thanks, uh, my uh, best appreciation for you uh, for attending this SAI event and let's keep in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you.